Biggie, it's time to review some books, isn't it, Biggie? Yes. Oh, is is that one yours? Is it? Okay, we. I'll just. Yeah, you can just have them all then. I'm already really, really hot, but whatever. Let's get on with this. Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my monthly wrap up. So this is the wrap up for May 2018. Here we go. Here is what I read. <laughs> Oh, yes, it's bloody, it is hot under, in here under the lights and whatnot. I'm wearing my Harry Potter tie and my suit. In case you're wondering, I, I sometimes forget to mention this. I, it is just now a tradition that I wear a suit for my wrap-up. Uh, because why not? Although I am regretting it at the moment because it is boiling. But what can you do about that? Anyway, let's go through some books. So, let's start with Till September Petronella by Jean Rhys. So this is one of the Penguin mini modern classics. I will link below to where I have reviewed these because I reviewed each of the Penguin mini moderns. And so I'm not going to go over each of them too much here. To be honest, this book was pretty forgettable. I already can't really remember it. I, I will admit I didn't enjoy it much at the time. Hey Biggie. I mean, what can I say? I, I read a lot of books and I, d I don't remember this at all, so it can't have been that good. Uh, I guess, thinking about it now, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5, I suppose? I literally don't remember this. So, <laughs> so it was apparently not that good. Not the best start to the wrapper, but hey ho, let's continue. Okay, next up we have... The Vulnerable Gods by Todd Wittenmeyer. So Todd is Todd the Librarian here on Booktube. This is his novel. It's kind of about, it's got little vibes of time travel, uh, kind of bits about Neanderthal man in there, but also it's kind of like a police procedural. So I did review this as part of the indie read along and the link will be below. Most of my problems with it came from, it, basically it has non-standard formatting which Todd was already aware about and things like random blank pages and whatnot, uh, double spacing and this and that. And also sort of typos and spelling mistakes and grammar fails here and there. I mean, it's an indie book so you expect it to a certain amount but um, I, I don't know, it felt like there were quite a lot in this. I gave it a 3 out of 5, it sort of shows, shows promise, you know, and I would definitely read more of Todd's stuff in the future. As to whether I'd recommend this over the other books on this wrap-up, no, but there are a lot of books on this wrap-up. It's also, it's not my worst book of the month by any means, so I will, at the end of this video, I'll let you know my worst and best books of the month. Okay, next up we have Yours Etc by Graham Greene, and this is literally Graham Greene's Letters to the Press, 1945 to 1989. So, for those of you who don't know, Graham Greene is one of my favourite authors. I'm actually almost going through a renaissance of his work recently because I've read maybe 40, 50 books by him and I'm kind of coming to the end now. So, sorry, just playing with my hair. I've kind of got through most of his novels and, <laughs> I mean, I literally I bought one of his children's books recently because I'm trying to read everything that he ever wrote and so... Yours, etc. Letters to the Press kind of comes under that category of everything that he ever wrote. I actually read this as my sort of evening book before going to bed, and I've since moved on to um, his uh, his collected essays. So, yeah, it's I mean it's fine. My problem with this actually is that the letters are all fine, right? But <laughs> they're kind of not given any context. So he's talking about stuff, and I have no idea what he's going on about. Like he's talking about the lines on the liberation of Cuba. Kennedy showed himself less a man of destiny than a Hamlet, a prince whose courtiers were out of control. Great. I wasn't alive then, so I don't really know what you're talking about. Mr. Colm Brogan writes, Nothing that Mr. Green writes can surprise me anymore. I remain, perhaps charitably, surprised whenever Mr. Brogan taps his typewriter by the number of cliches he deposits on the page. Who is Colm Brogan? There's no context to any of these letters. Who is Dr. Mulick and where are the Naga Hills? There's no context to any of these letters. So, I gave it a 3 out of 5. That's 3 out of 5, 3 3 out of 5s in a row. So, not the best start to the reading month, I suppose, but hey ho. At least I'm ticking books off that were on my list as well. By the way, in case you can hear some weird noises, I've got a cat here. Biggie, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you cleaning yourself? Okay. See, when he sits there, the kitchen is in the background and it just looks horrible on camera, so... 
Okay, next up we have City of Fallen Angels by Cassandra Clare. So I read this because a bunch of us are doing a buddy read of like all of the Cassandra Clare books in order, one a month. So we have Sophisticated Books, Kit Kats Can Read, Damien Tariquez, and Lisa's West Coast Reads. All of us are reading through this series. Actually, I did enjoy this. The thing that I've found is that I've been enjoying the original Mortal Instruments books, but then... We've started on the Infernal Devices, and I've not been enjoying those very much at all. So, And I've got one of those coming up for June, so I'm a bit worried about that. But this one I enjoyed. I think I gave it like a 3.75. It's not quite a 4. So it's in between okay and good for me. That's how I would rate it. One of the problems I had with this is that she does this thing. Cassandra Clare keeps doing it where she'll kill people off and then they come back or whatever. And I'm just so over it. I hate it when people do that. That's one of my bookish pet peeves. Stephen King does it occasionally as well. And I'm like, you can't do that. It devalues death. You can't kill somebody and then just bring them back to life. George R.R. R. Martin's pissing, pissing around with it as well. Jesus Christ. Stop doing that. I hate it. And this entire book basically revolves around A, someone who's dead being brought back to life, and B, some, like, the love relationships or whatever, which I don't care about. I, I've never cared about, like, the love relationships in books or whatever. Sometimes they're okay if they form the backdrop to a good story, and I'll give Cassandra Clare her dues, like, the actual stories of the books are better than all of the random love affairs that keep going on throughout them. But this one was more love affair than most, and I just... Yeah, whatever. It is what it is. Okay, next up we have As You Wish by Carrie Elwes, and this is... Well, it's subtitled Inconceivable Tales from the Making of the Princess Bride. If you've ever seen the Princess Bride movie, or even read the book, you probably know roughly what this is going to be about. Carrie Elwes played Wesley, and what's interesting about this is it includes kind of contributions from all the other cast members. There's some great reminiscences about Andre the Giant, all kinds of good stuff. Matai's gone wonky now. It's really well written as well, very absorbing. I've heard that the audiobook of this is great, but I personally, I only listen to audiobooks when it's a reread of a book that I've already read. So maybe at some point I will listen to the audiobook of this. But all in all, I highly enjoyed this. Great little piece of non-fiction, awesome memoir. And uh, yeah, I think I gave it a five out of five because it was, it was good. It was very good. I mean, it was one of those books that I just didn't want to put down and when it finished, I was kind of sad that it had finished. And I would heartily recommend this one. And also, for those of you who didn't know, Carrie Elwes is apparently going to be in the new season of Stranger Things. Okay, then we have Nemesis by Agatha Christie. So this is one of Miss Marple's final cases, but it's not quite her final cases because her final cases are in Miss Marple's final cases. But it's book number 12 of 14. Uh, going into this one, my mom had told me that it was terrible. And so I was kind of reluctant to start it. And then I read it over the course of about a day, a day and a half and quite enjoyed it. I will give it a 4 out of 5. It was pretty good. It's not Christie's best, but it's certainly not her worst. There were lots of things I could see coming, such as the location of where uh, a body was, and also the identity of that body. So I saw both of those bits coming. But overall, it was pretty good. Yeah. And also, this is like a sequel to A Caribbean Mystery, which I read not long ago. So it was pretty good to read them reasonably close together, because I could kind of remember bits of the first one that then led into this one, but you don't need to necessarily read them in order. I generally just pick up random Agatha Christie books based on when I find them in charity shops. As you can see, this was a pound from Sue Ryder. Okay, then we have AC Crispin, The Paradise Snare, and I. this was a reread for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon. By the way, Catalyst Reads has disappeared from YouTube again, so... I don't know what's going on with the rereadathon, but I'm still doing it, and I know a few other people are also still doing it. So we're all good on that front. I can't remember. The thing, the challenge actually, the challenge from May was to reread a guilty pleasure. So I went for this, which is book one in the Han Solo trilogy of the Star Wars Expanded Universe books. They've now been declared non canon and legends or something like that since Disney bought it so that Disney can tell their own stories which is one of the reasons why I don't really give a damn about the new Star Wars films there's also the fact that to me it just seems like a cash grab and I, I, I don't care to be honest yeah this was an enjoyable reread for me I listen like I say I listen to the audiobook because that's what I do for rereads it wasn't a bridged audiobook which I didn't realize going into it but the way they'd done the, the abridged version of it was pretty good because it was abridged 
It was kind of insta-lovey, but it wouldn't be insta-lovey if you read the actual book. And I can kind of fairly say that because I probably read this at least a half dozen times, maybe more in, in, in my childhood. And yeah, it's pretty good. I'm going to give it a 3.75. It's not quite a 4. Okay, then we have Wolf in White Van by John Darnell. So John Darnell is the lead singer slash songwriter of the Mountain Goats, who are a band that I'm fairly into. I've seen them live two or three times, something like that. Sometimes cover a few of their songs on guitar. This is his first novel, although not his first book, I don't think. I'm not too familiar with his books. To be honest, I always feel a bit hesitant when a musician writes a book. But it was pretty good. I guess you would call it literary fiction. It's basically about this guy with kind of a facial disfigurement. And you find out how he kind of got that throughout the book. And he runs this sort of postal choose your own adventure game. So you send him a stamped addressed envelope with your next move. And then he sends you back kind of what happens. And this game just goes on and on. It's called Trace Italian. And this is one of those books where... For the first hundred pages, I didn't enjoy it at all. And then after that, things sort of started coming together and I enjoyed it a little bit more. But actually, I think most of my enjoyment from this came about after I finished reading it. It's one of those that you need to leave to kind of ferment in your head, I suppose. But I did enjoy it. Looking back on it, I'm going to give it a four out of five. I don't know who I would recommend it to. I would recommend it to you if you're a fan of the Mountain Goats or if you... You know, if you like those old choose-your-own-adventure games or if you're into Dungeons & Dragons, that kind of thing. The actual title of this comes from the fact that when you play songs backwards, people claim to be able to hear things in them. And Wolf in White Van is one of the demonic phrases that somebody claimed to have heard when playing a song backwards. Okay, next up we have two more Penguin Mini Moderns. So we have Franz Kafka, Investigations of a Dog. So this is basically a thought experiment that Kafka wrote in terms of what it would be like to be a dog, I suppose. And what makes a dog a dog? And what differentiates dogs from humans? I would argue very little. And um, it was interesting. I mean, I'm not the biggest Kafka fan. I've read The Metamorphosis and some of his other stories. And to be honest, it kind of reminded me of The Metamorphosis, except instead of being in a whatever it was, he was in a, was it a fly or something? I don't know, or a beetle or something like that. But instead of being whatever he was in the metamorphosis, he's a dog and he's investigating the dog. I mean, it was all right. It was for like a piece of like speculative non-fiction. Would you, is that what it, you would call it? I don't even know how you would classify it. I would say it's a pretty good introduction to Kafka and his style. I mean, I think I gave it a four out of five. It, it wasn't mind blowing. It's not something I'm going to reread. And I'm in no particular hurry to get to any more Kafka anyway. But it was it was all right. It was he was fine. When you got 27 books or whatever to go through, there's only so much you can say about each of the books because I don't want this to be too long. My wrap ups are usually half an hour to begin with. I've already been filming 16 minutes and. I don't know. I think we're less than halfway through. So let's move on. OK, so next up we have this way around. Next up we have Clarice Lispector, Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady. This is three intoxicating tales of three women from a giant of Brazilian literature. And this is another one, I just don't really remember it. I mean, I could tell you the three stories that are in this collection. I mean, I think even the quote at the front tells you why I would be uninterested in this. The quote at the front is, oh, what a succulent bedroom. All right, <laughs> uh, I'll give it three out of five because I can't remember it. Leonard Cohen, Book of Mercy. So I've read quite a few of Cohen's books, probably six or seven now. Book of Mercy is interesting because I think that there are layers to it that I just totally haven't been able to appreciate because I'm not religious or anything like that. So I feel as though, well, let's see, what have we got here? In this latest book, he again finds a new voice in a sequence of modern psalms that blend invective with elegy and religious meditation with thoughts on love. So, for example, thoughts on love, I can kind of understand that. I don't know. My, my uh, Myers-Briggs personality type is INTJ, which apparently means I know very little about love. It sounds about right. I don't know. I'm one of those people who I'm like, I don't know if... I don't even know if love exists as in the form that people try and sell you on in the TV ads and whatnot. But anyway, I will, I'm going to read you a, a, just one of the little psalms in this because they're not too long. And I think that will give you a good feel for whether you'd be into this. So 
Let's do this one. Number number 26. Sit in a chair and keep still. Let the dancer's shoulders emerge from your shoulders. The dancer's chest from your chest. The dancer's loins from your loins. The dancer's hips and thighs from yours. And from your silence, the throat that makes a sound. And from your bafflement, a clear song to which the dancer moves. And let him serve God in beauty. When he fails, send him again from your chair. By such an exercise, even a bitter man can praise creation, even a heavy man can swoon, and a man of high responsibility soften his heart. So what I did like about this, other than the fact it's actually really easy to read, you can read this in an hour as well, but it's just, I mean, Cohen has a way with words, you can see it from his lyrics, and it really comes across in this as well. I mean, the writing is beautiful, so even if I'm missing references and bits and bobs that I maybe might have understood if I was more religious or whatever, I don't know. The the writing itself is still beautiful and just a lot of fun to read. So I'm gonna give it a four out of five. I'm really hot. Oh I forgot. Where's my where's my drink? Subtle bit of promotional branding. Ah put that down there. Books for sale on Amazon. Okay, then we have a Rissard Kapuscinski, an advertisement for toothpaste. And this one I do remember, so you'll be pleased to hear that. And this is basically, it's like reminiscences of this Polish guy as he goes back to Poland after the war. One thing I will say is it says in the front he was born in 1932, so after the war he was 13. So surely, like it says on the back, the great traveller reporter finds an even stranger and more exotic society in his own home of post-war Poland than in any of the distant lands he has visited. But surely he wouldn't remember pre-war Poland very much if he was 13 at the end of the war. I don't know. I... But anyway, you can kind of get from the fact that the title essay is called An Advertisement for Toothpaste. We have uh, The Stiff was one of my favourites in this, which was about basically like a dead body being transported on its way to its burial. And so, yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting to kind of see Poland through his eyes. I did actually quite like this one. Whether I will read more Kapuscinski, because there's like a lack of additional information in these books. I don't really know anything about Kapuscinski. I don't know whether he wrote short stories as well, whether he was only an essayist. I have no burning desire to read any more of his essays, but I would definitely check out something else that he'd written. The, yeah, I guess. That's the best I can give you, really. It was a uh, 4 out of 5 for me if you want to get to know Polish literature. Probably a pretty good place to start. Okay, then I decided to go back to some Agatha Christie. So I picked up at Bertram's Hotel, which is another Miss Marple. It's actually the book that comes between a Caribbean mystery and Nemesis, which are the two that, you know, go one after the other. Which is weird that there's one in between. So I was talking to Mara from Books Like Woe about this and she said she remembered quite liking it but I think one of the reasons she liked it is because she reads Agatha Christie books for like the, you know, the social mores of the time and maybe like the gender structure and uh, the, you know, the class structure and stuff like this and I can see why At Bertram's Hotel would be a good book for that. She also quite liked the setting of Bertram's Hotel and I will agree that you know, the descriptive nature of this book was pretty good and did bring the hotel to life. Unfortunately, it was just really dull. I got kind of bored of the mystery element of it. So after a while, not only did I not really care who did it, I didn't even know what was going on. And then we have this really odd bit at the end of it where... I'm <laughs> just thinking about it now, just making me laugh. Miss Marple gets all of the suspects in the room <laughs> and then someone just goes... Oh, you got me, I did it. And she hasn't even accused them. Then they climb out of the window, climb up a drain pipe, and then suddenly, with no explanation, bear in mind, it's specifically stated that they're climbing up the drain pipe and the people in the room are going, oh, she's going onto the roof. And then suddenly she's in a car driving off and then the car gets in an accident and she dies and it turns out she didn't even piss and do it. I'm just like, what the hell just happened? It was like Cassandra Clare with all these people going out through windows. What is... I'm going to have to... I, apparently, that is what makes good writing. Somebody going through a window. I think I gave this 3.5 at the time, but I'm going to retroactively downgrade it to a 3 out of 5. It, it was... It was silly, is what it was. Okay, then we have... Uh, let me try and do the French 
pronunciation. We have Albert Camus. <laughs> so this is basically Camus writing about why people need to create dangerously. In other words, if you're not being controversial in some way, you're probably not doing your job right as a creator. One of the things that I actually said, I think, I don't know whether it made it into my final cut because I went a bit ranty, but I was talking about Kanye West talking about slavery is a choice. I feel like he might have been taken out of context a bit. Granted, I haven't seen the original interview, but if he's talking about like the modern day fact that we are all slaves to consumerism, Slavery is a choice, you know, whether if he's talking about black people being forced to pick cotton Obviously slavery is not a choice because I don't like Kanye West So I really don't care what he was talking about but I Think that the fact that he's getting himself into trouble by saying controversial shit is actually him creating dangerously and I don't know. I, I think maybe he might be a little bit less of an artist if he didn't do stupid shit, you know. In the same way that, like, you've got actual artists like Tracy Emin and, you know, Damien Hurst and stuff who have people going, oh, that's not art. Even, like, Marcel Duchamp with the urinal. Like, that is creating dangerously. And <laughs> they're remembered for that, you know. No, nobody's going to remember some dude who can paint a nice landscape, you know. You have to do something different, something dangerous, and that's what this book is all about. I can't remember what I gave this. In the future, I will maybe... Does anybody really care too much about star ratings? Because this is another thing. I don't care about star ratings. So let me know in the comments if you want me to be more strict with my star ratings. I mean, I could log exactly what star rating I gave stuff on good reason on my blog and stuff, but really, I, in my wrap-ups, I just tell you retroactively looking back at it roughly what star rating I'd give it and for this one I'm gonna give it another a five out of five it was a good read probably one of the highlights of the penguin mini modern range so far for me I still think the best might be the first one though the Martin Luther King okay then we have Daphne du Maurier Rebecca and I read this as a buddy read with a bunch of people sophisticated books who I think is still reading it at the time of filming uh, Lou G, who is a booktube viewer, but who doesn't have her own channel, but I think if we all nag her enough, she might get started. Who else was in it? I mean, I had problems with this specific edition, because the cover has a spoiler on it, and the introduction was riddled with spoilers, and people keep telling me, oh, well, that's, you shouldn't read the introduction. I think that's madness. Why would you, why would you skip, like, part of the book, read it, and then go back to the start? Like... It's a publisher's fault for putting really big spoilers in the introduction, especially for a book like this. I don't know why they wouldn't do it as an afterword. I also think as well, like, this was kind of published at a contemporary time with a lot of Graham Greene books, and those don't even have introductions. I don't think it needed an introduction. The introduction was only really here to try and sell Sally Bowman's Rebecca's Tale, which is authorised by the de Maurier estate, and which I most certainly will not be reading, nor will I ever read anything by Sally Bowman. So yeah, I was heavily spoiled going into this, and I think there was only one part of it that was a vague surprise. I've heard a lot of people complain about the pacing. I actually thought the pacing was fine. I thought it helped to build suspense. If anything, my problem was with the last hundred or so pages when loads of stuff happened and all this bit with the doctor at the end felt kind of contrived for me. I don't know. I think it should have ended before it did. But yeah, apart from that, I did enjoy it. I think I gave it a four out of five. I can definitely see the hype. I can see why it is a classic. I can see why there are so many spoofs of it. And I did post a full review of this as well, which you can check out in the links below. Okay, then we have Ben Sanders, the Robert Michaels, The Demon in the Trees. And this is by Ben Sanders here on AuthorTube and BookTube. Again, I reviewed this alongside Todd's book in the link below for the indie read-along. Well, I did say in that this has one of the one of the better covers I've seen on an indie book. There were one or two editing mistakes, uh, not too many, but enough that I kind of noticed and started flagging them. The story itself as well is actually remarkably similar to Todd's story. Basically in Todd's story, it's a bit of like a whodunit slash police procedural with this with this Neanderthal killing people. And in, uh, in, in Ben Sanders' book, it was a Wendigo killing people. But other than that, they were very similar, and I'm not accusing either of the authors of plagiarism because I don't think they've read each other's books. And I gave this one a 3.5 out of 5. It was pretty good. Uh, I mean, yeah. It, it's also set up a nice ending so that it could continue a series. Whether I would continue to read the series, 
Possibly. I think it would depend how well Ben sold it to me in his videos and whatnot. But I definitely think if you like Ben's channel, you should check it out. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was all right. It was all right. My, the only other criticism I had for this is that there aren't really any suspects. There's, like, one guy that you're introduced to quite early on who's very clearly a suspect. And then there are no other suspects throughout. And they spend about 150 pages trying to get a warrant to search this guy's house. And as soon as they do it, they're like, oh, yeah, it's definitely this guy. And I'm just like, I don't know. I think they could have tailed him. Why didn't they tail him? If they tailed him, they could have solved the case. Okay, then we have John Steinbeck, the vigilante. Yeah, it's John Steinbeck. I read Of Mice and Men earlier this year. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed this as well. The title story is basically about a lynching of a black guy. I mean... Steinbeck's really good at kind of portraying the down and out in society. The, also, I liked the last story in this as well, which was called The Chrysanthemums. In fact, I liked all of these. There's a fucking dead fly on the inside of my book. That's really sad because it's one of my favourites. Oh, I'm vegetarian as well. I'm, I'm actually probably going vegan. I'm trying to go vegan. So yeah, we have The Vigilante, which is about mob justice. Then we have The Snake, which is... It's almost, it's very creepy. It's basically about this woman who goes into a pet shop and just wants to see the the uh, the proprietor of this pet shop. It almost reminded me of the bit with Tom Green in uh, Road Trip where he's just playing the guitar, just going, BOM. Be brave. You'll barely feel it. Come on. Come on. You gonna fucking eat him? Eat him. Please, Mitch. Go get him, boy. He's right there. Kill him. Name him. Fight him. Unleash the fury! And then the third story in this is called uh, The Chrysanthemums. And it's basically about this guy who, like, lives in his van and sells flowers and repairs tins and stuff. And uh, this woman is like, hmm, I want to do that. It's pretty cool. It's a good read. So, yeah, I, I would give this four out of five. Then we have Fernando Pessoa. I have more souls than one. This is a writer from Portugal. He actually wrote under four different alter egos. I think more than four. I think this is just a selection of four. And... To be fair to him, each of his alter egos do almost have their own writing style. You can tell it's the same person, but at the same time you can't. Pretty beautiful poetry. For me, this is somewhere between kind of classical poetry and contemporary poetry. I think the fact it's been translated actually makes it more approachable to me because it kind of makes it less strictly adhering to form, which always does my head in. I think that can ruin poetry and often does. It was, it was pretty good. If you want to branch out and read some sort of modern classic poetry, I guess, uh, Fernando Pessoa, yeah, why not? Uh, 3.5 out of 5. Then we have The Life of I by Anita Konst and Rainus Petersons. So I've actually met Rainus Petersons. He drew me a fridge magnet because he's an illustrator. He did the illustrations for this book. This is a Latvian literature book. I actually picked it up at London Book Fair. I will link below to my vlog of when I went to London Book Fair. And it's literally just a series of cartoons about... I, the introverted Latvian writer. And there are, like, there is I, the man, and I, the woman as well. So it's an equal opportunities one. One thing I will say is I'm sure that this character here, that is based on somebody I've met. I'm sure it is, because it looks exactly like one of the, uh, the, one of the ladies who invited me along to Latvia. It's just little cartoons about being introverted. So, for example, it's Friday night and I'm all alone. Perfect! So yeah, I enjoyed this. I would give it a 4 out of 5 for what it's worth. I don't know if you can actually get copies of this, but if you can, check it out. Okay, then we have Stephen Fry, The Ode Less Travelled. And to give you an idea of how much I didn't like this book, when I filmed it, I actually set the corners of it on fire to make a point. <laughs> so I was going to buddy read this with Claudia from Spinster's Library, but basically I ended up reading it as my one of my bedtime books because... There's a lot of information in it and it's kind of, you know, difficult to sink your teeth into, I guess. The issue here is that Fry is super condescending. He comes across as an arrogant douchebag. It made me angry reading this, like really angry. Basically, he kind of implies that only his 
type of poetry is the acceptable type of poetry. He's talking about, he talks about how like people will call hip hop poetry or whatever. And he's like, no, definitely not. Talks about free verse poetry. He's basically like, no, that's not poetry. That happens to be the kind of poetry that I prefer the most. Things like spoken word poetry, for example. No, in Fry's book, you're only a poet if you write shitty structured verse. He does things like talk about how bad free verse poetry is by deliberately writing bad free verse poetry and then going, you see what I mean? And I'm like, well, I think you might have a bit of an agenda there, Stephen. I've previously liked Stephen Fry and I've read maybe six of his books. And after reading this one, I don't know if I want to read anymore. I don't even know if I want to support anything that he's in. It's, it's that bad in terms of how condescending he is and just how greasy and smarmy it comes across. I gave this a 2 out of 5 because the information inside about the different poetic forms and structures is correct. It's like factually correct. It's just the way that it's presented. No. Okay, then we have The 13 Problems. This is short stories featuring Miss Marple. And this is, as it might suggest, 13 different short stories. What I will say about this is that while the mysteries themselves are all different, the actual setup was very much the same. Just a group of people sitting around telling a story. Then they're like, oh, the answer was never found. And then Miss Marple's like, oh yeah, here's the answer. And then you move on to the next short story. So that actual framework of the stories was kind of boring and a little bit repetitive. But the short stories themselves are pretty good. A few of them felt familiar. So either I've read them before somewhere else or they were predictable, or someone else has ripped them off. But it was okay. I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. It was alright. It was better than at Bertram's Hotel. Worse than Nemesis, I would say. Yeah. Okay, then we have Shirley Jackson, The Missing Girl. So this is my first ever Shirley Jackson. It has a few short stories in here. It has The Missing Girl, Journey with a Lady, and Nightmare. I guess they couldn't get the rights to The Lottery, which is her most famous one, which is a shame because I do want to read that one. But I haven't read this, so I do want to read more Shirley Jackson as well. I think her writing style was quite absorbing. It was kind of... I don't know, it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. I will say that. But it was good. I think I'll give it a 3.75 out of 5. My favourite one was Nightmare at the end. And that's basically because I've had similar nightmares myself. And in it, it's kind of almost a take on like reality TV and that culture as well. Because it's basically this person being followed around this city by this van that's like, Mrs. X is on Colton Boulevard or whatever street name you want to use. And uh, it's really sinister because if she'll, she'll take off her jacket or whatever, like she'll do this, which I'm going to do because it's really hot. And they'll be like, Miss X has taken off her jacket. And uh, the first person to find Miss X and say, are you Miss X? They get a cash reward as well. Still bloody boiling. Jesus Christ. Stripping over here. Woo! Undo that top button as well, mate. Oh, Let's have some some squash hey Google what's the temperature the temperature in Wickham right now is 21 that's in Celsius not Fahrenheit I actually feel a little bit like I might pass out this isn't good but we're gonna soldier on anyway I don't have many more books to go okay next up we have one plus one equals three by Dave Trot and this is a masterclass in creative thinking Dave Trot is basically like an ad exec sort of ad agency guy. He runs his own agency and has won awards for it and that kind of stuff. As much as I hate to use the phrase, this book is basically about thinking outside the box. I'm going to read you part of one of his things just a little bit to um, give you a feel for his writing style. Here's an example of his thinking. So this is choice architecture. At a school in the USA, the girls in their early teens had just discovered lipstick. They would go into the female toilets to apply it. Then, giggling, they'd leave imprints of their lips on the large mirror. This made a lot of extra work for the cleaning staff. The head teacher asked the girls to stop. Of course, they ignored her. So she took the girls to the toilets for a demonstration. She said, it takes a lot of work to clean the lipstick off the mirror. She said to the janitor, please show the girls how much work it takes. The janitor put the mop in the toilet, squeezed off the excess water and washed the mirror. Then put the mop in the toilet again and repeated the process. From that day on, there was no more lipstick on the mirror. That's choice architecture. Don't try to force or nag people into doing what you want. 
except that they are free to choose, but you help them to choose what you want. So yeah, I gave this a four, solid four out of five. I probably would have given this a higher score if it hadn't been my like second Dave Trot book, because after a while they start to feel a little bit samey, but they're pretty good, pretty cool non-fiction for just making you think, you know? Then we have Gazdanov and Others, four Russian short stories. So the Others involved, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, we have uh, Galina Kuznetsova, Yuri Feltsin, Nina Berberova, and Gaito Gazdanov. I mean, I've actually not read any sort of classical Russian literature before. I do want to at some point. I did really enjoy these. I actually thought that these were... A pretty good sign if the rest of Russian literature is kind of going to be like this. As to whether it stands out above the other Penguin mini moderns, not really. It's a, it's a 3.5 out of 5. I mean, I do at least remember reading this and enjoying it. I probably couldn't give you any specific details by now, but hey ho. Then we have Haruki Murakami, what I talk about when I talk about running. And while this is kind of about long distance running, it's also about writing. For Murakami, I think the two go hand in hand. What's interesting to me is that he was about my age when he basically decided to quit his job running a bar and to start writing. And then that's also why he took up running, because he was spending a lot of time behind a desk. So when he was working behind the bar, he did a lot of physical labor that, you know, helped to keep him in shape. So that's why he took up running. And then because he wanted to be able to run farther, he quit smoking. And all of this is at a similar age that I am at now. And I've actually recently quit smoking. Let me check. I mean, oh, I don't even know where my phone is. I'll check how many days I'm on. I'm on about 50 days now anyway. I'm doing all right. I really enjoyed it though. I thought it was a lot of fun. And I would recommend this whether you're a fan of Murakami or not. Well, actually, I think what I said was that you need to be, you need to fit one of these three criteria. You need to either really enjoy running, enjoy writing, or be a Murakami fan. I think if you fit any of those three criteria, you're going to enjoy this book. And also it's not too long to read as well. I will give this a 4.5 out of 5. Okay, then we have Italo Calvino, The Distance of the Moon. So he was born in Cuba, died in Italy. And one thing that bothers me about these books, they don't tell you. They say translated by Martin McLaughlin, Tim Parks and William Weaver. Yeah, from what language? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't say. I always assumed he was Italian, but maybe that's just because his name's Italo. But anyway, this is almost speculative fiction slash non-fiction well it's fiction but it's kind of sci-fi and a lot of it is pretty much just non-fiction about how space works and stuff i actually find space terrifying so it almost read like a horror book for me but i did enjoy it i liked here as well that it's all kind of related to the solar system and to the planets and the stars and things like that we have uh, the distance of the moon without colours as long as the sun lasts and implosion. And that, to be honest, sounds like it could be like a list of <laughs> the poems that I write about things that freak me out. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. I enjoyed it. I would like to read some more Calvino soon. Hopefully some like full length stuff, a novel or something. And finally, my last book of the month. And it is Why I Write by George Orwell. And straight away, the first thing to say about this book is that it's really missold. It's basically the first five or ten pages are a short essay called Why I Write. And then we go into 120 pages of just him talking about politics. So it's not really about why he writes. I mean, he says in Why I Write that he writes for political reasons. And then he just starts to talk about his views about politics. And I'm like, well, it should be called on politics. It's not a you know that what I wanted was another book like Murakami that would inspire me as a writer and that's what I went into it expecting and that is not what I get and so because of that I didn't enjoy it anywhere near as much as I thought I was going to and I think it's a shame I think they have totally they've not done this book any favors by calling it why I write if it had been called on politics I would have still read it I just would have read it when I wanted to read all while talking about politics Another problem that we have is that while I do agree with some of the things he says in this, I don't agree with others. Still more, I think, is just totally irrelevant and was probably irrelevant within five years of him writing it as well. 
So I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a 3.5 out of 5. It was okay. I wouldn't go out of your way to get this. And I especially wouldn't go out of your way to get this if you're hoping for something containing Orwell's Pearls of Wisdom about writing. Because that's just not what this is. So yeah, there we have it. That is what I read in the month of May. I'm currently reading The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. And uh, I'm buddy reading this with a bunch of people. It's okay. I'm getting into it some more. It's nowhere near as good as I was expecting from what people have said. It feels quite gimmicky to me, to be honest. And um, just in terms of some of the ways it's laid out with like these little these little bits, question one, question two and stuff. Especially because it's repetitive. That's actually in the book. And just some of the, the writing style is quite, quite jarring for me. And just some of the different ways it's like, it's like, now let me take you to the future and whatnot. And I get it's meant to be narrated by death and whatnot. I'm trying to understand as well, like, what powers death has here, because it seems like sometimes he can see into people's heads and sometimes he can't. For me, a lot of stuff is happening in here that my editor would kind of criticise my books for, being like, well, it's head-hopping, he, you know, you wouldn't know that. And and so, and also it's quite often quite telly rather than showy. You know, it, death just tells us what somebody is thinking or what they want or whatever, and I'm just like... I don't know, it's quite jarring for me. So, I mean, it's fine. As you can tell, I also haven't been marking out much of it. I, I just, it's okay. I just haven't found much to really talk about from it so far. But I think this could have been 200 pages shorter, especially if they'd cut out all the gimmicks and just just made it a, you know, a, a historical fiction novel. I think it relies too heavily on these gimmicks. And I think that's why people talk about it. But for me, it's quite a turn off and... I'm enjoying it less than I would have if if it wasn't like that. So it's probably going to end up being in my top 50% of books. That's about the be best it's got going for it. But I will finish reading it and see what happens. As you can see, I have now completely removed the shirt. I'd actually finished filming. I ran out of space on my memory card as well. But I realised I forgot to do me best and worst. So this won't take long. Worst book of the month. Let's start with that. No surprises, it was The Ode Less Travelled by Stephen Fry. I mean, I actually set fire to the corners of it. Not that I condone burning books, I did it for comic effect. I have to stress that each time. Shouldn't have done it in the first place, really, but whatever. Yeah, don't read this. And my best book of the month was, in fact, Carrie Elwes, As You Wish. Really enjoyed it. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought that Carrie Elwes, the actor... Actually, he does write screenplays and stuff now. And he did have a little bit of help from Joe with Joe Layden, who is a New York Times best-selling author and whatnot as well. So, but yeah, good book. Anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.